OK, so hi, everybody. Um, before we really get started, I want to cover a little bit of my personal background um, and some basic vocabulary so we're all on the same page. Um, I'm Soren. That's your first piece of vocabulary. It's not a very common name. And if you come to Shy Hack Night regularly, you've probably figured out that I'm here pretty much every week. Um, my background is in tech ethics and in social impact data science. And I'm currently the lead data scientist at Ask Why, which is an early stage company focused on creating predictive technologies for small businesses that use data in responsible and explainable ways. Um, before Ask Why, I spent a couple years working for Adam over in the back as a civic tech fellow for Microsoft here in Chicago, um, collaborating with nonprofits and local governments on tech projects that were built collaboratively with the people who were served by them. Um, of specific relevance to tonight's presentation, though, I'm a pansexual technologist. Um, I won't go too much into fine distinctions between identities here, but pansexuality is considered by many to be a subset or extension of what we traditionally think of as bisexuality. Basically, I'm attracted to people equally regardless of their gender. Um, in the next 20 minutes or so, I'll use a bunch of terms that are really familiar to folks in LGBT plus advocacy circles, and I want to define them here for anyone who might need a little bit of catching up. Um, first, as you've likely already seen in the title of this presentation and on the Shy Hack Night website, I'll use the word queer very broadly to describe a wide range of sexualities and genders that fall outside of what has historically been considered typical in our society. This word, of course, has a charged history as a slur against LGBT plus people, but in more recent years has been reclaimed by us to describe ourselves. The word is also used to describe certain specific gender identities, but here I use it pretty much interchangeably with the acronym LGBT plus. Um, though those terms both cover both gender and sexuality, I want to note that a dis that there is a distinction between the two concepts and discuss my own place in the LGBT plus community. Um, while my sexuality, i.e. who I'm attracted to, falls under the queer umbrella, my gender identity does not. I am cisgender, which means that my self-conception of my gender matches the gender that I was assigned at birth. There are a wide range of gender identities out there, and it's important for me to acknowledge that I don't have the experiences of a non-cisgender person, since I'll be focusing quite a bit on gender-related data in this presentation. I want to be clear that my views are my own and should not be taken as an official messenger of like queer opinion on this topic. Um, just like in any other community, there are many conflicting views present in the LGBT plus world about data collection and data safety. So with that out of the way, let's establish a little bit of a premise. Longstanding marginalization has led to misinterpretation and misunderstanding of LGBT plus people. In a longstanding environment of fear, the vast majority of queer people have stayed silent about their identities in one way or another. I came out originally in high school, but was recloseted when job changes forced my family to move to Alabama. The caution with which I approach my own sexuality during that time persists to this day, and I don't actively discuss that part of me very often. We may have marriage equality in this country, and we can acknowledge that as a big positive step, but there are still many ways that it remains alienating and even dangerous to not be the magic combination of cisgender and heterosexual. Uh, this is amplified among already marginalized groups like LGBT plus communities of color or neurodivergent queer communities. The end result of all of this hiding, all of this fear, is that researchers' best understanding of queer identities and the social patterns of queer groups is highly flawed. The loudest voices tend to characterize a group. And a lack of granular data leads those characterizations to be taken as a given for that group as a whole, especially when research is applied in business contexts. And in addition to that, the very terminology that we use to describe our identity is highly fluid, adapting as we become more open as a society to exploring natural differences in sexual attraction and gender. Because the words we use to describe many identities are so new, Differing self-descriptions around the world also complicate research. 
The fact that we know very little about LGBT plus communities poses challenges much broader than queer related research fields. On a basic human level, queer voices are often quiet in the workplace where products and services are built, including digital systems. A recent survey whose methodology I unfortunately don't have on hand here found that only 30% of LGBT plus technologists are out in their workplace. And many don't feel comfortable speaking up on topics related to their identities. Most systems are not designed with LGBT plus users in mind. And it might seem weird to consider designing, the for tigen, uh, designing explicitly with tangential identities in mind, but we already do that with identities that we consider to be normal. This is especially true of some civic systems. When we do explicitly consider LGBT plus experiences, we often do so through a stereotypical lens or assume the needs of communities with unique needs that are often invisible to us. Let's talk about one way that data systems have evolved to include LGBT plus identities and the not so obvious drawbacks of that evolution. Gender selectors are very common in the digital tools that we use. And gender data is one thing that we here in the US at least are accustomed to being collected about us by countless entities, by governments, by health providers, by online retailers, and many require it before we access their services. As non-cisgender identities have become more commonly known and gained acceptance, the traditional binary options for gender offered by systems have started to change. It's not just the left of these three panels, though, that has major problems. Let's talk about the one in the middle, which is very common at the moment. In addition to allowing users to choose either of the two traditional options for gender, they can also designate themselves as other. While this technically captures all other possible identities, it lumps a huge diversity of genders under a single alienating term. This has big ramifications for data use after entry, since any content or functions that might be customized based on gender are essentially rendered meaningless by a data collection approach that puts every non-cis identity in a single bucket. It shows only a minimum level of care and understanding of additional gender identities and does nothing to forward our understanding of just how common certain identities are among a system's users or how those identities behave. The opposite approach is one taken by a growing number of companies and organizations like Facebook, seen in the rightmost panel here. In an attempt to be exhaustive, Facebook currently offers dozens of gender options for users to identify themselves. This attempt is flawed for a number of reasons, chief among them being that what's considered exhaustive at any given time rapidly falls out of date. Since we're finding new ways to describe gender and sexuality every day, when we begin to discuss these things more openly, there's really no such thing as an exhaustive approach to identity. Something that better reflects the needs of our diverse LGBT plus communities is this which allows free-form text entry of somebody's gender identity. Now, of course, if this information is displayed publicly, there is potential for abuse by people who like to make discriminatory jokes about gender identity. And any such system would need to put steps in place to prevent such abuse. Additionally, any data scientist in the audience could tell you that working with free text can make data analysis much more challenging than working with a limited set of options. But this is all for a good reason, because it produces a granularity of data that's simply impossible if we try to put everyone in boxes that they may not uh, fit in. This is what an inclusive data practice looks like. But I'm not here to talk about inclusive data practices. I actually believe that inclusion in this sense is often a misleading goal in the design of technical systems and causes more harm than good. And that's where we start to talk about protection rather than inclusion. Inclusion-based frameworks fail to understand that forced participation in a flawed data system can be harmful. It isn't enough to include or represent varying identities when the resulting functions are premised on bad assumptions about those identities or in systems where data is improperly secured, et cetera, et cetera. Let's consider this through a variety of lenses. 
inclusively collected data is almost always still subject to the same stereotype-based decision processes and content curation processes as non-inclusively collected data. Whether a human is in the mix of making content decisions or not, the data we feed into a system and the ways we act on that data frequently comes to align itself with existing social hierarchies. This can be as simple as creating content bubbles in which customized experiences on digital platforms mean that LGBT plus people are highly likely to see LGBT plus related content and non-LGBT plus people never have to interact with LGBT plus related content. It can be as devastating as presumptions of medical needs or limitations based on a person's identity, like the long-standing bans around the world on gay men donating blood or misassignment of sexual health services to somebody whose genitalia is different than what a rigid system presumes. And the rigidity of our systems themselves make them prone to what Professor Anna Lauren Hoffman from the University of Washington refers to as data violence. We primarily design systems that assume that something so supposedly innate about a person as their gender is never changing, which isn't borne out by reality. Immutability can be traumatizing for somebody who has discovered something new about themselves and wants to reflect that discovery in their social media profiles, their medical information, their driver's license, Data systems need to be just as adaptable as their users, but users can't reasonably be expected to be able to constantly update their information about things like gender and sexuality everywhere they have ever entered that information. When systems fall out of date with the people using them, those people can be re-traumatized by reminders of names and identities that they no longer hold. Which brings me to the subject of data republication. I'm willing to bet that more than a handful of the people in this room work for organizations that use data not originally sourced from them, or organizations that give or sell their users' data to others. In the civic tech world, we're all about open data, right? But beyond open government data, there's a whole industry of data brokers out there whose work involves scraping public records, buying user information from companies that directly collect it, and combining data sets as much as possible to get a full picture of a particular data subject, or in clearer terms, a human being. Problem is, when a user at the original source of that data changes their information or revokes permission altogether, that data modification or revocation rarely makes its way down the line to third parties who are now spreading out-of-date information to their clients. This is a highly unregulated field, especially in the US. Data brokers, at least in the US, the information they sell about people is generally an awful combination of poorly vetted, improperly consented, and secretively sourced. Many data brokers refuse to tell potential clients where they get people's information from in the first place because they don't want those clients to collect that information for free on their own. Those barriers to clarity of sourcing mean that whoever uses information from a data broker cannot be sure of the correctness of its data, let alone the ethics of the collection process. This monster creates situations in which people using an online service for the first time are confronted with auto-filled information with names they no longer used, are targeted with advertisements for a gender that doesn't align with theirs, and are unable to escape constant reminders of traumatic past identities. And that's just the start of it. If our goal was to align somebody's own experience with their self-conception, this conversation would be relatively simple. But unfortunately, even if we created a world in which every piece of data about a person matched their identity, we'd still be placing queer users in grave danger. If we collect gender or sexuality information, we must protect that information at all costs. Hacked databases, confusing user privacy settings, or malicious sharing of information meant to remain on one platform, they can all be used to harm LGBT plus people. There's a long history of queer folks being put in danger by those who try to out their sexuality or gender publicly when they themselves aren't out to friends, family, coworkers, the general world around them. And in many cases, our digital systems enable that kind of outing. 
On a larger scale, the legal rights that queer opposed governments assert over the data on digital systems that reside in their countries sometimes leads to situations in, in which d data about gender and sexuality is collected and then used to directly persecute people who are considered deviants in their local socio-political context. Which is to say this presentation isn't theoretical. You may have read the story of a pastor in Tennessee who called for the execution of LGBT plus people. That pastor also happened to be a sheriff's officer in his county and said unequivocally in an interview that he believed that it was part of the duty of police organizations to prosecute gay, bisexual, and transgender people. Imagine how he or an officer alongside him would treat somebody whose gender marker on their driver's license didn't match their gender expression when they were pulled over. A 28-year-old man in Fresno, California was arrested for claiming that he would cause a gay nightclub in the city to change its name to Pulse because, quote, you will share the same fate, referring to the mass killing of 49 LGBT plus people in Orlando in 2016. Imagine what he might have done if he had purchased a data set from a data broker that contained the content of dating profiles of people in Fresno. Such data sets are readily available. A man in St. Louis sent emails to the organization organizing its annual pride celebration claiming that he would come heavily armed and, quote, kill every gay person I can. Imagine if somebody like that was able to gain access to an improperly secured database on an e-commerce website that primarily catered to gay customers. All of this happened in the last two weeks. We may feel that we have come a long way, especially living in a large international city in which people can largely be open about their identities, but let's not kid ourselves. It is still physically dangerous to not be heterosexual or cisgender in this city, in this country, and around the world. Our industry bears responsibility for encoding and republishing information that can be used to target marginalized communities. And subfields like marketing analytics continue to normalize dangerous practices. We have to have a moral reckoning with what we consider acceptable in computing fields, in cases where gender and sexuality data isn't essential. Which brings me back to this. We can do better than this. How about we stop collecting? Instead of putting the burden on a user to fully understand the risks of sharing their highly personal information, let's put the burden on ourselves to treat that information right. If we have no strong reason to collect it or can't guarantee its safety, we shouldn't collect it. End of story. Is the danger to your LGBT plus users worth the ability to roughly guess whether somebody is buying a purse for themselves or as a gift, or to assume you know what kind of movie they want to watch? We have a responsibility to build safe technology. And to do so, we not only need to confront the limitations of the inclusiveness framework, but we need to intimately involve LGBT plus technologists and users in our work at every step of the process. Like any other marginalized community, queer people need to be front and center in conversations about how technology can help or harm us. Otherwise, we're destined to continue building systems that will alienate us, hurt us, or even get us killed when we could be crafting a digital world that works for everybody. It's Pride Month this month. And I take pride in the fact that I'm able to give a talk like this, discussing topics that may have been taboo just a couple short decades ago. I take pride in the fact that many of you here tonight care deeply about these issues and want to make a positive difference through your own work. But pride without concrete action is meaningless. So I call on you. Take pride in the act of creating systems that keep my community safe. Take pride in sleeping at night with the knowledge that you've done everything you can to include and to protect. And carry that pride forward so others can learn to do the same. Thank you. How realistic is it to expect companies not to collect data that they believe, wrongly or rightly, will help them in selling you things? Or selling your name and identity to other people to sell you things? I think that that question starts with conversations like this one. Um, I work in a field right now that is rife with practices 
that are focused on collecting as much data as possible at whatever level of granularity is possible. Um, there are companies out there, I, I've gone through their opt-out processes. There are companies out there that hold an immense amount of information about me. Um, everywhere I've lived, everybody I've ever lived with, um, a whole bunch of information that I thought wasn't public at one point or another on different platforms that I use. And I think that, of course, there is an economic benefit to having that kind of data. Um, of course, the Netflixes of the world are always going to want to know everything about you so that they can tell you exactly what you want to watch at a given time. Spotify wants to know your mood so that they can alter it. There's some really interesting coverage about that. Spotify actively tries to alter your mood to make you more susceptible to advertising. Um, these platforms thrive on knowing everything about you. And it's, it's sort of a natural extension of the fact that We've structured our digital systems in a way where everything about you can be given away in the first place. So partially, I think it starts with a moral reckoning, starting with having people say very clearly, especially if they are in a position of decision making or are in a position of power in their organizations, that we shouldn't do this. Um, and then on the other side of things, a lot of the infrastructure that enables this needs to change as well. The way that we think about data privacy in general needs to change as well. And I, I'm not an expert on different privacy frameworks. Um, obviously, there are a number of different privacy frameworks that are, are really interesting right now. GDPR is being litigated really heavily in Europe right now, and I'm paying attention to that. Because GDPR enshrines a bunch of rights like the right to data deletion or the right to a non-automated decision process. Um, those are all really interesting steps forward. But once you translate ethics over to law, then it gets really muddy and gets stuck in the courts. So uh, there's no easy answer. Um, but I think it does start with saying something's wrong. So a few years back, um, there was a dating app for queer people that was uh, hacked, I believe, and a lot of information was lost. Can you speak to the uh, Tinder generation and like the usage of that data information, how that could be harmful to LGBTQ people? Dating apps are a super interesting example because dating apps have actually enabled a lot of things for queer communities, enabled connections that were hard to make in person, especially in communities that aren't typically open. Also, they're an interesting example because dating apps are highly reliant on information about who somebody's attracted to. Um, when it comes to data apps, the key thing is data security. Um, if that information is being collected, which sort of naturally it is on a platform like that, there's that responsibility to keep that information secure. And there are a number of cases where, like, for instance, if I was to be in the dating world right now, I wouldn't trust Grindr because Grindr is owned by um, somebody who has made a number of homophobic statements uh, and has connections to the government of China. Um, and that's a whole other conversation when we talk about like China in these authoritarian uh, data collection terms, we're actually talking about a lot of the same types of surveillance that companies do here in the US, and it's a different cultural framing. So that, that sort of like scared talk that we hear about China surveillance all the time, there's, there's some framing differences there. That's a whole other talk. Um, but there are a lot of companies that I don't trust, but I'm also in a fairly privileged position of knowing how those companies handle data. And even being in a fairly privileged position of like theoretically knowing how these companies handle data, that doesn't mean that every company that creates a dating app is public in any way about how their data is treated or how their data is stored. So to expect a user to be able to make smart decisions about that is uh, a poor expectation. And when you leave a, a user in the dark like that, the, the responsibility falls on the platform. I think there should be severe legal consequences for any sort of data leak of that nature. Um, and I, I don't know of other remedies out there besides making there be consequences. I'm curious if you're aware of, like I'm thinking about the other different sort of dynamics with like queer politics and um, I guess I can't think of any uh, recent examples where that is intersected with data and technology as directly, but there's like a, there's a pretty strong tradition of political protests as well. And so do you see like a path for that? It seems like kind of a, a niche 
but like, is there room for political action, uh, boycotting platforms or anything like that? We're in the middle of Pride Month right now, and there's a whole lot of efforts underway to get YouTube kicked out of Pride parades. I'll tell you that because YouTube earlier this month made a really horrible moderation decision to keep a homophobe on the platform who was actively harassing a gay content creator. Um, and YouTube has had sort of internal revolts against this. Uh, Google as a whole has had some internal revolts against this. But um, part of the challenge we run into with that is that the way that pride happens today um, is the largest events around Pride tend to be very corporatized and very sponsor-based, and it, it's very f hard for the organizer organizers of events like that to um, kick out a large corporate sponsor, <laughs> um, which really tilts the power dynamic away from like keeping communities safe and towards preserving sort of this, uh, this sheen of we're a welcoming company. Just because a company culture is good doesn't mean that they're making good decisions that are safe for LGBT plus communities. Just because they have all their rainbow gear and they have a really active ERG doesn't mean that they're not harming queer lives. So to answer your question, absolutely there is potential for that. And absolutely there has been some action around that. There is an active boycott of YouTube right now. It's, it's limited in scope. The communities around it are fairly small. The, the creators who were involved, um, neither of them had like massive, massive audiences. So um, it hasn't gained as much traction as I would have personally hoped it would. But things like that are totally possible. Tech is not a silo. Tech is just part of our lives. And when a part of our lives is impacting us negatively, then it's time to take to the streets. Um, it seems like the, uh, the paths to protection are either increasing accountability on one end or also just kind of being a better consumer of knowing when you can and cannot opt out. Um, but you only know what you know, right? So, mm -hmm. so to that end, are, do, are you aware of any kind of front ends that, you know, if a form pops up on your browser, you get a sense of how safe is this form? That's super hard, um, especially because a lot of the systems that we talk about, like the example I gave of an e-commerce website, a lot of small retailers, which we, are, we love to support our small retailers, our local retailers, that kind of stuff, a lot of small retailers have really limited access to like great tech. And they'll build out something and plug something right in the website that's completely insecure. And when that retailer is selling stuff that primarily appeals to an LGBT plus community, then that puts those communities in danger, which is, you could consider that a fault of the retailer, but the retailer themselves probably doesn't have the tech skills in the first place or the technology in the first place to know that they're putting their users in danger. Um, I don't have specific examples of like widely used systems that are or are not highly secure because a lot of those systems are, um, are highly configurable. So in certain configurations, they would be highly secure. You can make pretty much any data collection system HIPAA compliant if you work hard enough. But a lot of them aren't very secure out of the box. I mean, you've probably seen warnings about never submitting passwords through uh, Google Forms. Um, I don't know how that information is transmitted. I think generally that warning might just be a, if somebody's having you submit a password through a Google form, their security practices probably aren't very good. But there might be something about how Google forms are transmitted that's not, um, not very secure. I don't know that, though. So somebody should look that up. <laughs> um, but I don't really know. So my question, um, kind of in regards to having um, trans, like non-cis people in the room in developing technologies and systems. Um, I guess uh, since um, trans and non-binary people um, encounter significant kind of systemic barriers um, to gaining education, um, having the resources to you know, do internships, all of that kind of thing. So I guess my question is, um, do you know of any kind of um, endeavors or initiatives within um, the tech world in general to kind of encourage trans and non-binary people um, to get into those fields and, and what does that look like? Yeah, there, there are a number of initiatives on that. Um, every marginalized community has specific challenges that are, are unique to that marginalized community, but there are also a lot of similarities between different marginalized communities in general outcomes, lack of access and lack of acceptance once there is access. Um, 
especially in certain tech subfields, there are a ton of efforts underway. Like surprisingly, given what you would think traditionally about like the culture of gaming communities, um, game development is actually a subfield of computer science where there's a huge trans and non-binary non presence and a lot of organizations that do work around recruitment, inclusion, training companies to do things the right way. Um, and also game development is a field that has a little less to do with data collection than some other fields too. So there's some side benefits of the actual work um, in some cases is less dangerous. Um, beyond that, I, this obviously, I'm cis and this isn't my area of expertise and I, I don't wanna stand up here and say that I am all, all knowing about trans and non-binary folks. So I'm sure there's a ton of specific organizations that aren't on the top of my head who are doing fantastic work and I would love to look those up and, and send you them when I find them. <laughs>